Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Northwest and our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm glad to be here. I say with the psalmist, I was glad when they said to me, let us go in the house of the Lord. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you guys are here. But most importantly, I'm glad Jesus is here. He's here with us tonight. So we've come to glorify him through this study. Tonight we're continuing our study through the book of Revelation. And our text tonight is Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. So please go ahead on and turn in your Bibles so you can follow along with me as I read. Revelation 2, starting in verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I had this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you tonight. We thank you for your presence here with us, Lord. We ask, God, that you would allow your words, God, to penetrate our hearts that we will be changed, that we'll be drawn closer to you, Lord, in a more intimate relationship. Speak to our hearts, Lord God. Have your way with us, dear God. Do great and mighty things here tonight in our midst, Lord. And for those that may be watching online. And Lord, if there's any here or watching, Lord, that does not know you as Savior, I pray, Lord God, that you would reach them tonight by your Holy Spirit, that you would Break open that rough exterior, Lord God, and you would finally show them how much you love them, Lord. And as you invite them to be yours, that they would accept and surrender to you and be born again. Lord, have your way with us, Lord, and as we do all things tonight for your glory and to praise and honor you, Lord, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write. This message is addressed to the angel or the messenger of the church of Ephesus. He's speaking to the pastor at Ephesus. And although it is addressed to the pastor, it's certainly not for him exclusively. It is a message to the church, each and every member. I wonder... As John received this message, if his heart was chilled. You see, John himself served in that role as the senior pastor elder of the Ephesian church. And although the words of commendation would make John's heart glad, the rebuke that follows would be particularly difficult. For John to hear, and you will see why as we get into our study. This message is to the church as a whole, but again, I say specifically to the pastor. You see, it's the pastor's responsibility to care for the church as a loving gardener cares for his garden. The pastor must do the pruning and pull the weeds. He must make sure that the plants are being nourished and protected. The flock's job is to obey the direction of the pastor as the pastor receives that direction from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
to oppose rather than to comply with the pastor's direction for the church is a disgraceful thing and it carries consequences. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. We'll put it on the screen for you. It says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. What a grave responsibility to watch over the souls of God's children and to give account. In performing this responsibility, I've had to be quite direct with some of you. And I pray that you would understand that any correction that I may give is out of love and care for you and, and deep gravity of this responsibility to guide you and direct you in the way of the Lord. Continuing in our text, it says, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. In each of these messages to these seven churches, we have a description of the Lord revealing to us his person and his character. Now, for the most part, these descriptions are what we've already heard in chapter one. It's just reiterating who he is and the characteristics of his person. Here we are reminded that he is holding the seven stars, these seven pastors in his right hand, and he's walking in the midst of the seven lampstands, these seven churches. Again, seven is the number of completeness. So it's speaking not only of these seven specific churches, but all pastors in all churches. He wants pastors to know, I have you. I have you in my right hand. You're safe. You're secure. And I am in the midst of the church. I'm walking around, Jesus says. I am interacting. I am beholding what is going on. Verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience. I know your works. Jesus knows what we do. He knows how we spend our time. The question that we must ask ourselves is Jesus knows our works. Are we assessing our own works for the Lord? Are you evaluating what you do for God? We all have jobs, jobs that most of us consider unrelated to God's work. Whether we work for an employer or whether we work for ourselves, which means we work for our, our customers, or whether we work at home, caring and educating our children or taking care of our household. What, whatever work it is that we do, if we are to do good work, we need to know our work. We need to assess our work, even more so if we find ourselves in a leadership position and are responsible for the work of others. We had better know their work. You can be assured that Jesus knows your work as individuals, and he knows our work as a church. He knows what you do. He knows how you do it. He knows the quality and the quantity of your work. Jesus knows every bit of your work, and he will judge your work. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to, to what he has done, whether good or bad. This, this judgment being spoken of in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is called the Bema Seat Judgment. It's a judgment for believers. It's not a judgment for unbelievers. It is for the unsaved. It's not a judgment for salvation. That issue has already been settled for those who have come to Christ. 
for salvation. It's a, a, a judgment of works. Will you be rewarded or will you suffer loss is what this judgment would decide. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. It says, now if anyone builds on this foundation, speaking of the foundation which is salvation in Jesus Christ, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, that day of judgment. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. God knows your works. He knows what you are doing, and he will judge you. When I was in the army, you just wouldn't believe. Some of you would. You've been in the military. You know what someone would do just for a piece of metal hanging on their chest, right? Or that ribbon. How much more should we labor for eternal rewards that we will receive in heaven? Rewards from Jesus. It's one thing to receive a medal and, and be thanked by a grateful nation for your service. But it's quite something else to hear the words of Matthew 25, 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. This should be the objective of our lives every single day to to work for the Lord in such a way that we would earn those rewards that he prepared to give us he has prepared us for them I know your works your labor your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil we'll address labor and patience when we get to verse 3 but I want you to know that Jesus is commending this church at Ephesus. Jesus is saying, I know what you do. I walk in your midst. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. We need to love what Jesus loves. And we need to hate what Jesus hates. If you're born again believer... If your life has been transformed by faith in Jesus Christ, then you should hate evil. What you love and what you hate should be rooted in God's word. That is where we find the standard for what we should love and what we should hate. Now, we as Christians, we often get a bad rap, don't we? We're, we're often accused of hating people, and nothing could be further from the truth. Just as Jesus died for all people because of his great love for them, we love all people with Jesus' love. The accusation of hate is simply a diatribe designed to make you compromise the truth. It's designed to force you to accept that which is evil. Don't fall for it. I don't hate people. I know you don't hate people. I don't hate sinners. Sinners are the object of our ministry. The Bible tells us that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And we, having been reconciled by God, have been made ministers of reconciliation. I love sinners, but I hate their sin. I hate their sin because it is keeping them from God. Their sin results in pregnancies out of wedlock, murder of innocent children in abortion clinics, drug abuse, broken families, broken lives, depression, despair. Sin 
if not forsaken, for trust in Jesus will condemn to an eternity in hell. So while I love the sinner for whom Jesus died, I hate their sin. To truly love is to be bold enough to tell a sinner what the consequences of their sin is. That's real love. Real love is not making allowance for someone's sin. It's not coddling someone in their sin. It's letting them know the consequences of their sin and helping them out of their sin, not helping them in their sin. He goes on, Paul does, or John does, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. It's imperative that pastors and also members of the flock be on guard for those who claim to be messengers from God and seek to influence the body of Christ. The apostle Paul warned the Ephesians in his emotional address to them when he was, he was leaving them. After spending three years ministering to them, he was departing, saying that he would probably never see their face again. Look at his words with me in Acts chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 17 to 21 and then verse 25 through 27. Starting in verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you. And taught you publicly and from house to house. Testifying to Jews and also to Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now verse 25. And indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What a testimony. What a testimony. That is the testimony we should all aspire to. When we are leaving those to whom God has called us to minister to for a time, that is the testimony we want to have. Maybe you're leaving a job. And moving on to something else. Or if you're in the military, you're being transferred. Or maybe you're a teacher and, and your, your students are moving on to the next grade. Whatever the situation, wouldn't you, be, wouldn't you like to be able to say what Paul said? You know how I lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility. How I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you. I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I want that to be said of me. That is what faithfulness looks like. Oh, to God that we would have that testimony of faithfulness in, in our own personal mission fields, wherever God has called us to be, that is our mission field for him. Paul continues in verse 28, warning them. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. 
Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul knew what was going to happen when he left. He knew because it always happens. It always happens. Paul spent three years preparing them, grounding them in good doctrine in order to fend off the attacks of the enemy that he knew was coming. Now we see in our text in Revelation that the Ephesians heeded Paul's warning because Jesus commends them for not bearing those who are evil, but testing those who say they are apostles and finding them liars. You have to test them. We need to be careful. Satan will always try to bring his people in to infiltrate the body of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded, just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. False apostles are smooth. They are subtle. They will sneak in among you and give the appearance of being righteous. But they have a tell. That's a poker term, right? They have a tell. They desire position and promotion almost instantly. They don't want to serve in lowly places. They don't want to be proven and meld into the body. They want to be recognized and regarded. We must be aware. Jesus continues his commendation in verse 3. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Ephesus was a church deserving of commendation. They were a hardworking church, full of good works. Perseverance and labor speaks of working to the point of exhaustion. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You're, you're multitasking, you're serving in so many different ministries. The word patience here is the Greek word hupomone. It's, it's constancy under great pressure and suffering. Ephesus was not a church of slackers. These believers served at great expense to themselves. You can imagine a church having multiple ministries and outreach to the community, doing great works for the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the church at Ephesus. Galatians 6.9 says, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, But as for you, Brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. We can see that the Ephesians were well in compliance with these scriptures. They worked hard. They served. They didn't slow down, slack, or cease in spite of hardship and suffering. All would be great if Jesus ended his commentary there. But there's more. And that more is really all that matters. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. All of their good works, all that they have done 
is nullified because of this one thing, the only thing, they have left their first love. I mentioned earlier that penning this message by the Apostle John would chill his heart. You see, John spoke of love frequently in all of his writings. And to hear that the church, which he served as the senior pastor, elder, had left his first love would break John's heart. I want you to note the words here because it's very important. They left their first love. It doesn't say they lost their first love. They left their first love. There's a big difference between leaving and losing, isn't there? You see, most often when we lose something, it's by accident. When I lose something, it almost drives me insane. I can't rest until I find it. I am searching everywhere looking for it. And that, that's usually the case when you lose something. You, you go looking for it. You, you miss it. You desire to have it back. But that's not the case when you leave something. See, when you leave something, you know where it is. You know where you left it. And leaving is intentional. It, it may not always be sudden. Sometimes you can leave very gradually, incrementally, little bit by little bit almost imperceptibly until one day you realize how far you are away and that you have left. What is this first love that the Ephesians have left? Now, most would choose the obvious answer, Jesus. I agree with that answer, but I arrived there via an indirect route. There is a principle of hermeneutics, Bible translation. It's called the law of first mention. It says that when something is mentioned in the Bible for the first time, that meaning usually continues throughout. The first mention of the Ephesians' love is Ephesians 1.15, where it speaks of their love for all the saints. So I, I do agree with Jesus being their first love, because you cannot love the saints without first loving Jesus, and vice versa. You cannot love Jesus without love for the saints. Look at 1 John 3, 14. It says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He that does not love his brother abides in death. Loving God's children is an evidence of salvation. God puts that in your heart. When you love him, you love those who are born of him. The Ephesians, having left their first love, doesn't mean that now they hate the brethren or that they hate Jesus. It means that the passion that they once had, that they first had, has waned. And this is a dangerous thing. To have all of those good works without love is a dangerous thing. How can you have all of the good works that that church had, yet not have love? You see, you can train your flesh to do good works. Did you know that? I mean, after walking with Christ for so long, righteous habits become just that, a habit. You can do them out of habit. There is numbers of false religions that are works-based and even cults that train their people to do righteous works. But they don't do it out of love for God because they don't know him. And knowing him, having relationship with him, is all that matters. 1 Corinthians 8.3 says, 
But if any man loves God, this one is known by him. See, if you don't love God, God does not know you. You recall Matthew 7, 21 and on, where it says, Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this, that, and the other in your name? And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. See, they didn't love God. Because if they loved God, they'd be known by God. They didn't love him. Romans 14.23 says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. The Ephesians had plenty of work for God. But any work done for God must be done in faith. And faith and love are intertwined and cannot be separated. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Faith and love are intertwined and cannot be separated. In talking about love, I need to say this. It's important that I say this. Love is not an emotion. Love can certainly be emotional. But love is not an emotion. I'm not going to get into the Greek, breaking down the different words for love. We don't have time. It's going to be a long message anyway. You know, if you want that breakdown, go back to the website and look up my study on 1 Corinthians 13. I break it down there, I believe. But what I'm going to say and repeat it is love is not an emotion. You cannot rely on the emotions of love. When you're feeling it, go for it. It's all good when you're feeling it, but you can't rely on it. I love to feel that emotion of love for my wife. And I feel that emotion with great fervency the vast majority of the time. But let me make a confession. I don't feel it all the time, right? Sometimes, sweet Kellyanne, might say or do something that offends me or hurts me. And I might not feel that love for her at that moment. But that doesn't mean I stop loving her, right? If a Christian husband comes to me and tells me, you know what, Pastor, I don't love my wife anymore. You know, I've fallen out of love with her. You know what I'm going to tell him? Repent. Repent. Love is not an emotion. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Love is a choice. If you're a believer and you don't love your wife, repent and love your wife. It is a command. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Love is a choice. If you find yourself cheating on Jesus, then you are leaving your first love. What do I mean by cheating on Jesus? If you find yourself sinning with no conviction, you've left your first love. If it's getting easier and easier for things that you know you shouldn't do, to do those things You have left your first love. If you're constantly falling into immorality, if you're enjoying spending more time with unsaved friends than with believers in Christ having fellowship in Jesus, you've left your first love. Husbands, if your passion for your wives is cooling, you're leaving your first love. Wives, if your respect for your husbands is lacking, you are leaving your first love. And this one is for everyone, man, woman, boy, and girl. 
you go by the name of Jesus. If you spend all of your time thinking only about yourself and your problems, you're losing your first love. You're losing your first love. Because to love Jesus is to love others before yourself. Bible tells us to esteem others greater than ourselves. Jesus gave us the example of servanthood. He didn't think about himself. Jesus came and suffered and died for you and for me. And the love that he had for us wasn't ooey-gooey emotional love. It was the choice that he made to love us when we were yet sinners the Bible tells us Christ died for us. Love is a choice. Emotion is great when it's there. Ride it. I love it. I love when I have that emotion for God. But don't rely on emotion because emotion isn't always there. Love is a choice. What is the solution if you are losing your first love? Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. The first thing to do is remember. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Peter says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. See, sometimes we need a reminder Sometimes we need to remember. We need to look back and remember when we first fell in love with Jesus. For me, and I'm sure for most of you, that would be the day he saved me. The day that I knew my sins were forgiven and I was going to heaven. Now some may be slow starters and didn't fall in love with Jesus right away. But they fell in love with him as they got to know him. You need to remember that point. Or maybe you're here listening online and you don't know what it means to be in love with Jesus. You either don't know him at all or you don't know him well enough. Let me tell you how to get to know him. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Remember, I said faith and love are intertwined. They cannot be separated. The more time you spend in God's word, the more faith you have. Faith is belief and trust. The more belief and trust you have in Jesus, the more in love with Jesus you will be. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. And do the first work. See, it's not enough just to remember. You must take action. Repent. Repent means to turn around and go in the opposite direction where you're headed. If you've left your first love, you need to turn around and go back. Repent and do the first works. You need to engage your will. Love is a choice. Repent is a choice. You must do it. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Jesus isn't giving a suggestion here. He is giving a command and he is telling the consequences for not acting. He says, I will remove your lamp. There won't be a church. I will not be in the midst of the lampstand. There won't be a lampstand to be in the midst of. That doesn't mean that the believer will lose his salvation, but the believer will lose power in his life. He will lose intimacy with Christ. He will lose protection from Christ, which may result in the loss of his life. God is in plain. When the Corinthian church was disrespecting communion, Paul said, this is why some of you are weak and sick 
and why some of you have died. That's in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. if you want to go look at it. Jesus is not playing. He says, repent, or I will remove the lampstand from its place. Then he goes back to commending them in verse 6. He says, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans, Nico meaning above. Laetans mean laity, the people. You hate the deeds of those who are above the people. Peter 5, verse 2. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseer. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Those that put themselves above the people. What did Jesus say when he was walking the earth? about the Pharisees. They love to be called Father. They love to be in the midst of the people. They love to put themselves above. Jesus hates that. Jesus has called us all to be one. There is no levels in Christ. We are all one. I don't get to wear a big hat and you bow down and kiss my ring. Jesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and so did the church at Ephesus, who was well taught by the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. Verse 7, Jesus says a phrase that he will repeat to each church. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It is for everyone. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And to this specific church, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life. When was the last time we saw the tree of life? The Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had access to the tree of life because they had access to all the trees in the garden. They were only forbidden to eat from one tree. They weren't forbidden to eat from the tree of life, but they chose the tree that was forbidden. And once they sinned and they died spiritually, Jesus put them out of the garden. And he put an angel with a sword there so they couldn't have access to the tree of life and live forever in a fallen state, in an unredeemed and unregenerated state. But here, in these last days, he's looking prophecy ahead. The tree of life is restored. And to him who overcomes, I will give to eat. From the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. God is promising paradise, glory for the ones who overcome. The Bible tells us that we are more than overcomers through him that loves us. The battle is already won. All we need to do is just be obedient. All we need to do is walk with Jesus All we need to do is be careful not to leave our first love. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you have done all the work for us. God, your word tells us that it is you who work in us 
both to will and to do of your good pleasure. God, you have given us your spirit. You have given us everything. You have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All we need to do is just deny our flesh. All we need to do, Lord God, is just humble ourselves and present our bodies as living sacrifices to you. Gracious God, I pray now that if there's anyone listening to this message that does not know you as Savior, that does not have that relationship of intimacy and love with you, that right now, Lord God, as they reach out for you, Lord, and as you call them, as they believe, that you are God, that you shed your blood on Calvary's cross, that you were crucified, buried, and you rose again from the grave. As they open their hearts to receive you, your word says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. If that's you, simple prayer, Lord Jesus, save me. He will save you if you cry out from a true and repentant heart, willing to turn away from your sin. Receive Jesus now as your Savior. Saints of God, if you have strayed, if you have wandered away, if you are leaving your first love, please repent. Turn. Go back to Jesus where you will find safety, where you will find the peace of God that passes all understanding. You will not regret it. Lord God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for your presence. We ask that you continue to dwell with us, Lord God. Guide us as we go home and dismiss us, Lord Jesus, in your presence. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in your name. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. Hope to see you Sunday for um, service at 1 o'clock as we continue in the book of Ephesians. God bless you and good night.